For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. So glad you're back to join us for another Receiving the Word message. This is part two of a two-part presentation. If you missed part one, I want to invite you to go to our website, SACCentral, S-A-C-Central.org, and click on the Media Resources tab. Have your Bible in hand as we go live now to part two of this timely Bible message. Even though we may not find it pleasant, it's far better to discover those hidden defects now, while there's still time to address the problem, then defer it to the harvest when it's too late. Now is the time to apply the corrective measures if they are needed. Now is the time to, mit, to permit the Spirit of God to apply the necessary prescription for healing any blight or any infection in the vines of your individual and personal life. We must keep on top of everything and be aware where the pest and the mildew is, but there's something else too. We must especially be aware of, and that is this. Those unrighteous sentiments that can quietly, stealthily tiptoe in to the vineyard and hide themselves under leaf, underneath the leaves and the branches of your heart. And there, if left alone and untreated, they will spread out along the vines to destroy the fruits of what could be a godly life. They have a habit of creeping in, those little sentiments, those little things, you know, but they bring the corruption, and if we don't discover them and do, don't do something about it, they'll go down row after row after row and transform your promising life into a vineyard of wild, nasty, sour grapes fit only in the harvest to be cut down and cast into the fire. Am I preaching hellfire? I don't want to be a hellfire preacher, friends. I don't want to be sensational. But in my Bible, it mentions hellfire. And Jesus has said about the wheat and the tares. The tares are gathered into bundles to be burned. So let's not shy away from taking into counsel the whole counsel of God. Any grapevine that hasn't been cured of what needs to be cured of that grapevine's choice will be cut down and cast into the fire. Who wants to go there? I don't, you don't, none of us do. So let's agree. We won't go there, right? So every day we must submit to this walkthrough with the Holy Spirit and this prayer. Prayer on our lips and in our hearts from Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's anything, any sin in me that I'm not aware of, but you see. I want you to show me, even if I find it disagreeable, and even if it hurts, I want you to show me, Lord, we need to deal honestly with our own souls. And if you don't want to deal honestly with your own soul, God won't show you. If you want to be left to deceptions, He's not going to work a miracle to leave you, to, to get you. If you want to live in a deception and a delusion about yourself, He'll let you go ahead and do that, and the devil will be delighted to just build that delusion about yourself all the more. Can't let that happen. So search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Gospel Workers 276. Self-knowledge. Okay, this is how we get self-knowledge, going down those vines and asking God, show me, show me, show me. Self-knowledge will save many from falling into grievous temptations and prevent many an inglorious defeat. 
In order to become acquainted with ourselves, it is essential that we faithfully investigate the motives and principles of our conduct. Comparing our actions with the standard of duty revealed in God's Word, we need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God like never before. There's no mystery to this. No, We need to immerse ourselves in the Word of God, not just reading, but imbibing it so that its spiritual, its sanctifying power comes in and it changes us. Born again by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. And a prayerful attitude, search me, O Lord. Help me to know the real deal about myself. We need to do this. Such self-knowledge will help us be aware also of another major, but sometimes not particularly recognized threat, and that is this. I want to talk about little foxes. Little foxes. Foxes, as you say. In Song of Solomon 2.15, it speaks of the little foxes that spoil the vines. Have you ever read that verse before? Song of Solomon 2.15, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Now in the Hebrew, what's interpreted in the King James as foxes could be interpreted as jackals. There were these little jackals in, in Palestine a long time ago, but there were also foxes. That's verifiable. In fact, there were two types of foxes that existed in ancient Palestine. And it is written that in the spring, these little foxes would make their way into the vineyard to, to nibble the tender vines. Just little things, but naughty little things. And as such, they are therefore a metaphor of the devastating effects of cherished sin which is hidden away and left unexpelled from the heart. Therefore, it is crucial that we learn from this, that we learn, sorry, it's therefore, cru there's a crucial lesson that we learn about the little foxes that spoil the vines in life's vineyard. And it's this, once they are discovered, they must be immediately and mercilessly destroyed. And somebody says, oh, Pastor Mike, but the little foxes are so cute. They're so adorable. Try telling that to the chickens. Try telling that to the grape farmer. Somebody says, how could you be so cruel? But there's an answer, simple answer to that question, dealing with the little foxes of cherished sin. It's either, your, it's either their life or it's yours. What is your choice? It's as simple as that. But unfortunately, the human heart, when not decidedly surrendered to God, is always inclined to be in sympathy with sin. Maybe not fully in sympathy with sin, but just enough sin to still maintain, and just enough righteousness to still maintain a you know, religious life. But there's still enough sympathy to, towards sin. They just can't bring themselves to cherish those sacrificed and sacrifice those little idols that get into the vineyard of the heart. And what happens? Those, those little foxes get to live another day. And they get to live another day, nibbling at the vines and wreaking destruction at the very core of the Christian character that should be growing and flourishing as a vineyard but instead things go in the other direction. But every time you spare that cute little fox that nibbles your vineyard, every time you give it sympathy, every time you might think, oh, but it's such a cute little fox. It's so cuddly and warm. I find it so comforting. Every time you give sympathy to that sweet little lamb, that sweet little fox. What about the sweet little lamb that had to die for you to pay the price of your folly? We too often prefer the little fox over the little lamb. 
and you know who I'm talking about and what I'm talking about. What about the sweet little lamb that gave its all to rescue the vineyard of your wicked, selfish, and ungrateful life? Isn't he worth it? Isn't he worth more sympathy and love than all the little foxes in the world? I should hope so. But you see, the sweet little lamb will never get more love and sympathy until we first fall out of love with the cute little foxes. You get it? And there's only one cure for that, and I'll tell you what it is. And I guarantee I won't tell you anything you don't already know. If you want to learn to fall out of love with sin and really fall in love with Jesus, you need to gaze upon the cross long and often. That's all. If you want to fall out of love with sin and fall in love with Jesus, you need to gaze upon the cross long and often. And if that's all you take away from here today, then I'll feel that I've done something worthwhile with this day in my life, with this day in my vineyard. You see, it's God's prescribed means, looking at the cross long and often, of making and keeping our naturally hard hearts soft and sensitive toward the suffering that Jesus had to go through in order to save us. Neglect this one thing, looking at the cross, and your heart quickly becomes hard and resistant toward the righteous transformation that God is seeking to bring around in your life. And I know that because I've done it many, many times. I can testify to that. My heart can be as perverse as anybody's. And I've learned through experience where I need to go to be safe. I need to look at that cross long and often every day. And when I do that, I'm okay. But if I don't, boy, I know about it, and so does God. And the vineyard doesn't flourish as well on days like that. So if you don't look, and if you resist that righteous transformation that God is going to bring, the vines will wilt, and the grapes will turn sour, and all the little foxes will just keep coming back in. So we must, we must go and gaze on that cross where Jesus hung for you often and long. And often because it will soon be harvest time, I say again, when God comes looking for fruit. And so before that time, he wants to raise us to a whole new level of heart sensitivity toward him and to the lamb he sent down here to die for us. So that as we develop this higher sensitivity of love and appreciation toward God and toward Jesus, in turn, we can love righteous. We'll start to love righteous like righteousness like we never have in our lives. And we'll, fi we'll find that he's able to put a hatred for iniquity in us, something we may have never known before in our lives. This is the power of the gospel, and it's not difficult, and it's not complicated. So we must gaze upon the cross long and often, and as we do, our hearts will meld ever closer and deeper into God's heart. So it will be impossible to be able to tell where your heart ends and his heart begins because your heart with his will become one. Then his love and righteousness and his hatred for sin will flow into your life as a mighty torrent. I didn't get the verse, but in, in Isaiah 48, it, let, let me read it. I think it fits. I, I scribbled a note, and I think it fits it. Isaiah 48, verse 18. We read this. O thou, oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments. This was God's plea with the Jews who had the vineyard, but they'd lost it. He said, oh, that you would hearken to my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. That promise 
is for us. And that promise can be fulfilled in us today if you haven't already understood what I'm talking about and you're not already experiencing that. That, that can be ours. And the longer and more often you look at the cross, it's necessary because before the cross of the crucified and the risen Lamb, I already mentioned this, excuse me, God will create that enmity inside you toward evil. The first promise given in the gospel in Genesis 3.15, God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. God said to the devil, hey you, you will have your children. Here are my children. You think you've got them? Well, they got fallen natures now, thanks to Adam and thanks to what you did. But I'm going to put enmity between you and them. And the devil probably thought, what is this enmity? And maybe Adam and Eve thought, what is this enmity? But it was Jesus. That enmity that steps in between temptation and the devil and God and you is Jesus himself. And when Jesus comes and lives in your hearts, and when he lives in my heart, he, put, he puts the same qualities of his life and his experience become our experience. And that's where the enmity comes from. And if you've never asked Jesus to, come, to do that in your life, you must ask him now. And he will come and he will do it now and he will transform your life. I say again, because your life is a vineyard given to you as a sacred trust from God. And with that comes accountability, and with accountability eventually comes consequences for good or for bad. And if things are not good and if things are not right in your vineyard, I urge you to flee to God, to Jesus for pardon and healing before it's too late. Now, I want to share with you a statement from, and I won't be too long now, I want to share with you a statement from volume 7 of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. It's a little bit from two letters from Ellen White, a review in, a review in Herald, August 14, 1900, and, and uh, another reference here. Um, my manuscript release is 58. I want to tell you, this is really somber, okay? But I, I want to read it slowly. I'd like you to listen to it. And, I'm not trying to sound trite, but I know this is for somebody in this church this morning. I don't know who, but God knows who you are. I'm going to read it, and it's somber. But I promise you, if you'll bear with me, we're going to finish on a very encouraging note. Do I have your permission to read this? Yes. It's a good thing, because I'm going to read it anyway. The harvest is coming soon, right? In his dealings with the human race, God bears long with the impenitent. In case somebody doesn't know what the impenitent is, it's those who refuse to repent. God speaks to them, convicts them of sin, and they, they refuse to repent. He uses his appointed agencies to call men to allegiance and offers them his full pardon if they will repent. But because God is long-suffering, men presume on his mercy. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. That's from Ecclesiastes. The patience and long-suffering of God, which should soften and subdue the soul, has an altogether different influence upon the careless and the sinful. That's not God's fault, that's theirs. It leads them to cast off restraint and strengthens them in resistance. They think that the God who has borne so much from them will not heed their perversity. If we lived in a dispensation of immediate retribution, offenses against God would not occur so often. But though delayed, the punishment is nonetheless certain. There are limits even to the forbearance of God. 
the boundary of his long suffering may be reached, and then he will sorely punish. And when he does take up the case of the presumptuous sinner, he will not cease till he has made a full end. And just over here, tiny bit. Every offense against God's law, however minute, small, right? Little foxes, right? Every offense against God's law, however minute, is set down in the reckoning. And when the sword of justice is taken in hand, it will do the work for impenitent transgressors that was done to the divine sufferer, and that is Jesus. Justice will strike, for God's hatred of sin is intense and overwhelming. Now, I told you, that's pretty heavy stuff. But we're close to the end. And I think we really need to think about these things. The Jewish nation lost their vineyard because of this very thing. Make sure you don't use, lose your vineyard and with it your salvation. So I want to say this in conclusion. 2019 has just begun. We're still in the growing season. But this year might be the last for some of us. And I'm not saying probation's closing in March. I don't mean that. I'm not time setting. But some of us, we're getting older, including me. This year might be my last growing season. Anything is possible. But one thing is certain. For all of us, sooner or later, the growing season will cease and harvest time will come upon us. And God will come looking for the fruits of righteousness and the unblemished purity of our righteous lives in return for the priceless investment he made for our sakes and the sacrifice of his own son. When that day comes within God's church, there will be many that will echo the loud haunting and wailful lament of Jeremiah 8.20. The summer is ended, the harvest is past, and I am not saved. That cry will go up, friends, just as sure it's written in the Word of God. But you don't have to cry that lament. Let others do it if they must, but you don't have to. Do you believe that? Yes. Why do you believe that? Because you have a Savior who lives even yet. He is a mighty Savior, and though you may have sinned, He's still a merciful Savior. And when we heard that song sung this morning about in the sanctuary, where is your Savior? He's up in that sanctuary, and his name is still th your name is still there, graven upon the, the palms of His hands. He can save you even yet. And if you were a prodigal, if you wandered away from where you should be, and you finish up herding pigs instead of growing grapes, which is what you're supposed to be doing. If you're like the prodigal and you once had a, a, a vineyard, but you lost it. And if you're like the prodigal son and you long to go back to your father's vineyard, but the devil's convinced you can't do that. He won't listen to you. He won't let you for a moment. Don't listen to him. But if you feel and you want to go, go, go back, understand that you can and you will if you will trust Him. Today, He will pardon you. He'll pardon you for every wicked little fox you've ever petted and every filthy pig you've kissed and, and rolled around in the mud in the pigsty. From the little sins to the gross ones, from the little foxes to the pigs. He will forgive it all and wash you clean. And all you have to do is ask him in the name of the sweet little lamb that he sent to die for you. God will give you a whole new start and a whole new vineyard and a whole new life. A healthy, flourishing vineyard where the Lamb reigns supreme in your vineyard and not the foxes. And in that vineyard where Jesus reigns, He will personally instruct and empower you so you can grow the biggest, juiciest grapes of a godly life than what you ever thought possible. 
Can you say amen? amen? Remember. Remember this in conclusion. While Jesus is the head of his church, his earthly vineyard, they all had to live in the vineyard of his own personal life when he lived down here upon this earth as a man, just like we have to. Jesus knows the challenges of growing grapes. He came with the same weaknesses and liabilities that we have. He experienced the same struggles that we have. Hebrews 4, it says he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he didn't sin. And the devil with Christ, he sent foxes by the dozen, by the dozen, by the dozen to try and get into the vineyard of Jesus' heart, but they never did, not even once. And often with strong crying and tears, Jesus prayed for strength to endure, to resist the foxes and the corruption of sin and to keep growing grapes in the vineyard of his life, however tempted it was for him. And he did that. He did that for our sakes. He grew those grapes. And as he grew those grapes, and he succeeded... If you come to Jesus, weak and helpless and dependent as you are, he will graft your weak little vine, your weak little life into his vine. He'll graft your life into his life. For he is the true vine of John 15. And you will bring forth, you will become a sin-resistant vine. You will bring forth the fruits of righteousness. He will graft you in and from your life will come forth an abundant harvest of, 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 of the fruits of grace. And that grace, as he taps you into the vine, that sap will flow into your life. And you will be what Jesus always wanted you to be, a fruitful vine in the fruitful, glorious vineyard of his last church. And I close with this, John 15, 16. He says, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He's chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So ask and you shall receive and your vineyard shall be full and your cup will runneth over and you will rejoice in the vineyard of God. God bless you. We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to sacentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.